Hello and welcome everyone to our next unit. This is going to be on ancient Rome. We're covering about roughly a thousand years from about 500 BC to 580. And our first opening lecture of the unit is going to be on Roman geography. The key question we want to answer for this unit is how does a small city on the Tiber River in the center of the Italian peninsula be able to grow to conquer not just the Italian peninsula, not just be able to go over the Alps to the north and spread across Western Europe, but be able to go and spread from the Atlantic Ocean to the Tigris River, from Scotland in the north down to the Sudanese border in the south, and then at the height of its power, begin to constrict, begin to decline, divide in half, and then finally uh, end. So we're going to start like we start with most of our units with the geography and the Italian Peninsula is known for being well watered, meaning it has lots of uh, rivers, unlike we saw in our previous unit with ancient Greece, as well as lots of mineral and agricultural resources. So it's got a lot to offer to everybody. Uh, as you know, to kind of help us out here, we've got a map for homework tonight. Uh, it'd be able to go and, and say that it's shaped like a boot. It's got a heel and a toe in the south. The toe looks like it's kicking the island of Sicily. The peninsula itself has two major mountain ranges that are going to influence its geography. The mountain ranges are the Alps in the north, as well as the Apennine Range that runs down the center of Italy. Uh, I like to be able to say that the Apennine Range is the spine of Italy. So the Apennines run down the spine of Italy there. So if you're walking out of the ocean, the western shores, you walk out of the Mediterranean onto the beach, right? You begin to watch uh, kind of coastal plains. You work your way up the Apennines, back down coastal plains, back into now the Ionian Sea on the eastern border. Now, these mountain ranges are going to have in, big impacts on Italian geography, but we want to make sure we're clear that these mountain ranges are have a different impact than what we saw in our previous unit with ancient Greece, where we saw that the mountains of Greece uh, very much transform not just the geography, but the subsequent political, economic, uh, social development of that country. The mountain range here are going to be influential, but not play as center of a role as what we see in, say, other uh, places. Three uh, major rivers affect Italian geography as well. You have the large rivers of the Po and Arno River in the north. Think of um, major cities like your Milan's, your Venice's are on those rivers, as well as the Tiber River in central Italy. And, and the Tiber is where Rome will be built and will be established upon. Uh, it flows right into the Mediterranean, uh, a, a major tributary to be able to um, go from the interior of Italy outwards. There's three fertile plains. You have the Po River Valley in the north along the Po River. You have the plain of Latium around the Tiber River and in the center of Italy around what will become Rome, as well as the region of Campania around Naples. And that's not all the way in the south of Italy, uh, but more southern, uh, south of Rome is probably the best way to say it. The nice point about the Italian peninsula in and of itself is that it's the midpoint of the Mediterranean Sea. And we'll see this come up in Rome's development. And again, going back to that idea of the central question here, how does this small city become to dominate not just the Mediterranean, but Western Europe, North Africa, uh, Western Asia, is this idea of its centrality within the Mediterranean Sea itself. Rome will turn the Mediterranean Sea into a Roman lake, and it does that because of the centrality of it in the Mediterranean. It's not the laser-leveled satellite geographic center, uh, but for all intents and purposes, it becomes very much located in the center of where things are moving throughout the Mediterranean Sea for this thousand year period, giving it a large influence and, and still part of the reason why Rome is a major power player in the Mediterranean today is its location. So what we see here is a topographical map on the left, a little bit on the right there, or just more there. Uh, again, we see in the north, let's get out the laser pointer. All right, we, we kind of see, again, the Po and Arno rivers in the north, and you kind of see the Po River Valley flowing towards Venice, uh, the northern Ionian Sea. Uh, you've got the uh, Tiber River and the plain of Latium in the center, and then the region of Campania towards Naples in the south, southern central of Italy there, and all the way towards the tour of the boot. 
Now, the Alps Mountains are pretty formidable mountains in that uh, they very much, again, think of Italy as a boot. This is where you're putting your foot into that boot and act as somewhat of a barrier to be able to keep the peoples of Italy in Italy and the peoples out. Now, eventually the Romans will be able to find ways to find through the mountain passes of it. So this is not an impenetrable mountain system like we see with some other ones or very difficult to get across. But there is some formability to these uh, imposing mountain ranges. Uh, and again, it's going to be able to be a, a big player in keeping Rome in the Roman peoples and the peoples of the Italian peninsula early on in its history, somewhat protected from northern invasions. The Apennines, and this is just a, a picture, this is more towards uh, Tuscany uh, area or, around Florence. Run down, again, freshman high school speaking, the center of Italy uh, from the spine of the Italian peninsula. And uh, they're not, they're bigger than rolling hills. They're not Rocky Mountains. They're not the Hindu Kush or the Himalayas, uh, but again, a, a, a hindrance to be able to smoothly be able to walk from one side to the other. It's not walking across Illinois, for example. Now, in pre-Roman tribal Italy is inhabited by non-urbanized tribal people. So we're talking uh, as we move just on the tail end of prehistory into early historical for the people who are in Italy. Uh, lots of different peoples uh, living in these uh, mountain tribes as well as farmers in the valleys. So we have about 40 languages and dialects have been determined by historians, archaeologists from this time period. And uh, from all these different groups of people interacting, we basically can see that there's hunter-gatherers more in the mountains, farmers in the valleys, and then over time they're going to kind of work together and, and combine. So by the year 1000, we begin to see three groups fight for control over Italy. And they're going to kind of settle in their different groups for about a 500 year period. And we should know these different groups for our quiz at the end of the unit here. So the three groups who are going to fight for control of Italy are the Etruscan people in northern Italy. Uh, we'll talk about them in the slide here. Uh, the Latin people in the center, what will eventually become around Rome. Rome speaks the language of Latin, so it makes sense the Latins are there. The third group are going to be the Greeks in the south. So on the, the toe, in the heel, the boot, and this makes sense, that's the most closely located towards mainland Greece. These three groups are going to be playing off each other, trading with each other, interacting with each other, as well as fighting for control over the Italian Peninsula itself. So a very interesting question is to pop yourself in this time period, talk to these different groups, and kind of see or place a bet maybe who's going to be able to rise out into power from these three groups because very much looking at it from the time period none really have a bigger advantage than the other um, even though we've talked about the whole Greek unit in, in, for the Greeks in the south there they're trading but the Etruscans are trading in the northern Italy so as well as the Latins. The point we're trying to make even though we get the Etruscans, the Latins, or the, slash the Romans and the Greeks is that those are just three of several different groups in the Italian Peninsula. So this map isn't even the best representative of all the different peoples that are there. And it's important to understand how geographically, how resource blessed Italy is to support all these different groups, which is going to become a major important reason when the Romans begin to rise and absorb slash conquer these groups into their system. That's going to give the Romans an advantage over other ancient peoples. We'll see that play out in different ways. But that's the emphasis we're trying to pull out and bring here as we're talking about these different groups. So the Greeks, 750 to 600 BC, the Greeks are going to establish colonies in southern Italy. And it should make sense that these Greek colonies are going to bring eventually all of the Italian peninsula in the Greek world. So you might be in Etruscan way at the foothills of the Alps on the Po River in the north. So you might not be day-to-day -day working with those Greeks, but as those Greeks are trading in the southern part of Italy with the Latins, who are then trading with the Etruscans in the north, they become more aware of the that Greek influence, that Hellenistic culture that the Greeks are putting out. So those Greek colonies are going to have an influence on the later developments of the Romans, but it's more of that Greek world that the Greeks have built trading on the Mediterranean are going to have a much bigger influence in bringing all the Italian peninsula into the wider Mediterranean world.
The Etruscans is the other group we want to mention who are going to have a strong influence on Roman civilization. They're skilled metal workers and engineers, and I, we're, 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 we got to get into the meat and potatoes of the Roman Empire here. We want to understand that the Etruscans are going to influence Roman religion, Roman statecraft, Roman writing, as well as Roman architecture. Uh, the Etruscan use of the arch is going to become a key feature of Roman architecture, and we'll, uh, we'll then see and we kind of move out there is that the word arch has the word architecture in it where does that come from it comes from the etruscans eventually as we'll see they'll be absorbed in the roman state but they are a pretty well-defined culture and civilization before that happens as they eventually again get ruled into the romans so as we see here in finishing up with the etruscans we can see the metalwork that they're doing the bronze work in the upper left the uh, helmet on the right and the gold work there and the big key thing is this idea of the arch and the architecture. Uh, this is an Etruscan arch, and we're going to see this played out through the rest of the unit. So that's where we're going to stop for today. Just want to get into a little geography, and then we'll start pick up uh, with our next lecture on early Roman history as we begin to see the rise of these peoples.